Hello, everyone, to the Propeller Live Forum, January 17, 2024. Ken has the week out, so I'm just assigned to get this going and get out of the way. Recording is going, and we will have some updates from Chip, and then I'll open for more discussion. So, Chip, you want to get going? Sure, yeah. So I don't have a whole lot today. I have made a... Um... 8-pin ADC input using this bytecode interpreter idea. And I was, uh, I've been thinking about how to expand it, but the, what I run into is that what a customer might want to do could be so varied that it's kind of hard to make a one size fits all because the timing is kind of like Swiss cheese or something. You know, you, you've got to like adapt to the holes where you can fit new stuff in. And uh, it's not, it's, it, it would be like quite a project to make something that would comprehensively compile like complex IO, IO operations. But anyway, I've got a little um, thing running that uses the bytecode to do uh, eight pins at once of analog to digital conversion, and it's working pretty well. And I just posted it on the form if anyone wants to look at it. Let me see here, I'll share my screen. Uh, Okay. This is the uh, Visual Studio Code system that Stephen Morocco put together. Um, I have here a little program that can run to actually generate the analog signals that the ADCs can look at. Um, but in the end, you can write bytecodes like this uh, which are defined below, which can kind of like uh, configure and then run every step of the system. Um, so, and I kind of think, I think we kind of covered some of this idea last meeting, um, but these bytecodes here actually call out the pins that I want to be ADC. So this is the, the pin number first, and then we have the, uh, what power of two decimation you want for filtering. So four would be, uh, give me every, give me averages of 16 samples. So these, the sampling rate is occurring at 100 kilohertz. Actually, I think, yeah, right now I have this divided by two, so it's 50 kilohertz. I found that not running at the highest overclock speeds makes the ADCs work a little better because they were designed to run at about 200 megahertz. So when you overclock them to 320, things get a little hairy and makes a little more noisy of conversions. You still have an improvement because you're converting more, but it's not, it's not linear. There's some drop off. Uh, anyway, so this is gonna give me, it, if we're at 50 kilohertz every 16th one, what's that about three kilohertz or no? Let's see, um, 50 divided by, it's gonna, yeah, about 3.125 kilohertz sample rate, but it's pretty accurate. So, uh, when I run this thing, what we get is you know, lengthen this a little bit. We can see the eight pins, and I've, I have them zero through seven, right? So, uh, and I think I'm now outputting about a, a 10 millivolt. Is that right? Yeah, it's about a 10 millivolt peak to peak signal from my function generator. So I can change it to a uh, you know, ramp or, or square wave. But anyway, you can see here there are eight channels. And if I, if I pick my, uh, right now we're looking at ADC seven, I can plug the function generator into ADC six. Oh, I also added uh, some auto uh, ranging on the scope so that when you're looking at data, you don't have to try to always, you know, enter in what its exact range is. It just looks at all the samples in the in the buffer and and uh, fixes the range to those limits. So it makes it easy. I also added some auto triggering, which I'm not using in this case, but it will actually stabilize the signal. Anyway, I can step the uh, pin I'm using around, and you can see that. Each pin will do a conversion is about 10 millivolts of range. Mm -hmm. 
if this is zero channel. So I'll turn this thing off and it's, it's just spitting out the conversions down here. There we go. So there's eight pins worth of conversions. Um, now, what I did is I, I broke each piece out uh, that has to do with running conversions. Like uh, this is the part that measures each ADC pin. And it will actually detect, it'll determine whether to jump into ADC 0, 1, 2, 3, depending on how many channels you have enabled. Um, here's the part that does the uh, cortic solving of the uh, you know number of microvolts and it averages those together down here. And I think, yeah, at this point here, it's actually taking the decimation and kicking out samples every so often into the into main memory. And then there's quite a bit of variables to support things. And then uh, this down here is the are the uh, bytecode definitions uh, for the various functions. Any questions on any of this? So I posted this on the forum, and uh, it's under the uh, the thread is called I think it's called Improved uh, ADC Pin Techniques. If anyone wants to look at it, it's it should be pretty easy to adapt to your own application. But what it will allow is one cog to just about as quickly as possible do accurate you know DC based conversions uh, on up to eight different pins that you select, and then it reports the data into the hub memory. And uh, the way you can detect a new sample is to wait for a non-zero value. And when you get that, that's the sample. And then write a zero value back, or you could put negative some big number, and use that as a as a method to determine when a new sample has come. And the, and all these decimation decimation rates that you can select will result in different update times. Like uh, yeah, right here, these fours mean every sixteenth. If I put you know, an eight there, it would be every 256. And in, in my loop where I'm watching for it, I wait until I've, we've got a non-zero value. Then I show it. And then I clear it. And I'm actually just using the first longs in RAM because they're not used for anything. So I should, ultimately, this object should take a pointer and then uh, put it somewhere you actually can specify. So we don't, we aren't presumptuous about how the uh, low memory is going to get used. Anyway, that is that. Uh, Chip, as an aside, um, can you tell me how you're compiling and running here in this environment? Uh, you mean how we're using VS Code? Y yeah, I think you're running Peanut behind here, aren't you? Oh, yeah. It's, it's whatever you set me up with. It shells out to Peanut, so... When I do a control F10, it, uh, you know, runs the compiler and then it sees my debug command. So it does this. Excellent. Yeah, I just wanted to bring that up so people know that this is a feasible thing on Windows to do. Yes. And it works quite well. Yeah, it works great. And it's, it's really nice. It's, I kind of have been spoiled by seeing the coloring because, you know, now when I look at, uh, just straight code in black and white, like from Peanut itself, it's it's not quite as rich, you know. My mind doesn't have as much to grab onto. It's it's much better to uh, see things in color. So Stephen did a great job with this thing. Thank you, and I'm always excited to see it being used. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been using it on uh, Windows, but I haven't done the extra step to hook up Peanut automatically. I toggle back and forth, but I know there's a step there that I can hook that up and make it nicer. Yeah, this is one of the, uh, well, yeah, Stephen set me up. You probably have some little tutorial in your docs, right, Stephen? Yeah, so I saw that step and uh, was too anxious to get going and not figure out VS Code stuff. 
Yeah, in yeah. summary, basically, you're going to drop in a file, a configuration file for for um, VS Code, and then it just works for all projects you work on. So there should be a cut and paste example at my repo. I'll look up a link and post it in chat if that'll help anyone. Yeah, that would be good. Anyway, I can stop sharing this for now. Um, Stephen, do you want to talk about what we've been working on otherwise? Is that something we want to talk about publicly yet? Well, we might as well. OK. We're well, working. Yeah, go ahead. Do I need to stop the recording or? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, no, I keep it going. I know that people hate when in YouTube we stop the recording when something is going to happen. Yeah, keep going. We're working on a, a, a port of- This is what we say to make it go viral. That's it. We're working Anything on- Anything you call private and confidential close like wildfire. <laughs> so, we're working on a, a, a cross-platform port of Peanut. That'll be a, a command line compiler, not an interactive editor. And uh, Chip and I are collaborating together and I won't go much further on it other than we've started, we have a shared working environment uh, Chip's environment and mine are shared and linked together, so we're in good shape to get it underway. So give us a, give us some weeks or a month and a half or so, and let's have some news after that. Maybe maybe some early spoilers for next live forum or something. Yeah, it's been kind of a project. I mean, my my normal PC down here, uh, it's an i7, I think, but we couldn't enable virtualization to run these Docker containers. So I had to get a new computer. So I looked around and I went all over the place trying to spec out like, okay, we need a, a case and a motherboard and a processor. And it was like a complete nightmare. Nothing seemed to like come together. So I just went to Amazon and saw this thing. It's like a little uh, Intel i9. It's got, uh, I think, two, 32 gig of RAM and a two terabyte SSD. And uh, it was like about a thousand bucks, but this is a whole computer. It's kind of cool. So you can plug a monitor into it. It's got lots of USB ports and it has Wi-Fi. So this is the new thing that I'll be working on to do this project. This whole VS Code thing and all this modern way of doing stuff, it's like really a big, there's a lot involved. I mean, it's before you get to uh, worrying about your actual problem, there's a lot of setup involved and a lot of stuff but steven has a handle on it it's a little overwhelming to me just been following his steps and then a separate subject if you want me to the uh we released another uh chip worked on the tail end of last year another release of the flash driver and so the flash chip on the uh, edge modules uh, the new release of the flash driver supports uh, read modify write, and it's as robustly tested as the prior version was, so it's in good shape. So feel free to use that. That's out in the forums as well. Yeah, so you can read modify write files. Um, I'm going to get back on the uh, USB project so that I can get keyboard and mouse support. I, I want to have that done for the P2. Um, there's not much left to do on that. It's probably going to take me two weeks or so. Hopefully next month we'll have something to show. Now we can talk about anything. You have a you question in the chat about the ADC from Howard. He said he doesn't have a microphone, so. Let's see. It's about the ADC. Oh, so it'll it at, at about 320 megahertz, it will run uh, all eight channels at 100 kilohertz sample rate with I think about 10 and a half bit quality. Um, and then as you divide from there, if you want to go 50 kilohertz, you'll get another bit. And for every time you have or you double the sample period or have the sample rate, you pick up another bit. So um, in the end, it gets to be about, I would say around 16, 
16 and a half bit stable. Um, but you have to go beyond where this formula I'm describing, you, you've got to go another, you know, having or so, because there's a, a diminishing return on, on the trade-off between uh, sample period and resolution. But you can play around with it and kind of feel it out. It's, it's not very complicated. Uh, Eric and Marco, yeah, are they here today? Well, where's Eric Smith? Is he here? I don't see him. Yeah, we need, uh, John's been pushing me for a, 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 a USD driver. Um, hey, Howard asked, do we use it for a lo-fi driver or lo-fi audio? Uh, ADC, uh, you know, I I would like I need to test it for that. It might be okay. Um, if you're interested in AC conversions, you don't really need to be doing all this um, calibration and math each for each sample. Uh, but when you don't, the calibration kind of cleans things up because there are some drifts that are going on in the ADC. And I don't know I don't know really what they're caused by. I think it's what could be termed one over F noise. Um, you can't quite get rid of it, but by taking, you know, limited time samples of power, ground, and signal, and then doing an equation to figure out where the signal was between power and ground, I think we can get rid of a lot of that. Uh, so that's good for, um, you know, instrumentation type conversion. But I don't know if that might actually help the quality uh, for, uh, audio conversions. It might have some positive effect. I just need to try it out. Because it'll, you, you can digitize a microphone pretty well, but it's not what you consider hi fi or anything. So you really wouldn't even need anything this elaborate if you just want to do uh, like AC coupled conversions. That's really simple. You, no need for calibration at all. You just simply take readings, and that's all you need to do. Howard said this would be interesting for synth stuff. Yeah, the, the chip was uh, in, designed with a lot of um, DSP stuff in it, like the Cortic that can do coordinate rotations and whatnot. And that's really useful for uh, synthesis. I have not even spent any time yet working on that kind of thing. Time. But um, it's the potential's there to do some stuff. Just wanted to let you know that I've been muting for background noise. Uh, if you want to say something, just check. Maybe you are muted and you can ask your question there or contribute. Yeah, I would like to work on synth stuff. Everything is in the in the chip to do, you know, to synthesize hundreds of human voices at once. I just haven't taken any time to work on that, but I'd like to. I feel like I'm always kind of uh, dealing with tool issues and enhancing the tools and not so much working on applications. Now, if there's anything any of you want to discuss, just pipe up and say it. We can talk about whatever you'd like. Have you well, thought about doing quick. an IDE on the propeller? Have I thought about doing an IDE on the propeller? Yeah. Yeah, I, I would really like to. I mean, Stephen and I are now working on something that can, you know, ultimately run in a browser. Um, but yeah, I really like the idea of tools on the chip just because I, I see things are so complex these days that it just before you can write the first line of code, there's a lot of stuff you get pulled into and it involves like 
gigabytes, wouldn't you say, Stephen, of all kinds of things that need to be downloaded? I mean, it's it's quite a bite. And Stephen is familiar with this stuff. I have kind of shunned away from the, these sorts of things because I'm overwhelmed enough just trying to, you know, write code. But the way the modern system works with, um, you know, GitHub and VS Code and uh, Docker, it's it's a big bite to take. I'm, I mean, I, there's advantages to getting there, but personally, it's like it's it's kind of overwhelming to me. I like the idea of keeping things simple and it seems that things are moving in an opposite trajectory where they're becoming more and more complex. Yeah, it's kind of like, instead of building something that actually works, they sort of built a shit tower on top of the previous shit tower. Yeah. So what yeah. actually, so like, oh no, like like you, you see this happening uh, like in real time where, um, they always build the new thing and it's always on top like uh right now the thing that they're doing on the um on like the linux side is okay we have all this like uh well dll hell it's not really dlls but you know like oh no the library like different versions everyone has like a maybe it's, it's even a different name on different uh distributions so they had the genius idea what if every application that you install on your computer has like its own little operating system, right? Uh -huh. A full set of uh, libraries and everything. It's just, it doesn't have its own kernel. They haven't gotten to that yet. Um, it's running as like a container under the main kernel, but like everything gets its full set of libraries. And of course, sometimes it, it doesn't, the plumbing doesn't work and it doesn't find your um, configuration files in your actual operating system. And then like your fonts are weird or something. Yeah, yeah. Ada, Ada, furthering that thought, we were looking at a, a Ubuntu lately and they've always had the APT package installation system, which is extremely robust, been around for a long time. Um, in someone's mind, they decided that Snaps is a new installation technology that includes all these dependencies for the package you're downloading, which is very much akin to what you're talking about. It's a near version. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. It, it, it basically puts it into like a little runtime box that. Yeah. And wow, what a mess. I don't know. Why uh, we're, I don't know why. Uh, we're um, there, but, you know, <laughs> this is something I actually installed from the like snap store because they didn't have an, a normal APT package. This is actually what it looks like. <laughs> Missing some fonts and things, is it? <laughs> yes, this is this is I didn't do anything. This is just how it is. That's Gee, also I notice I normally have um wait, do you see what I'm seeing? Or... Oh yeah, it's yeah. okay. Yeah, we see it's visible. Um it's the unknown font character there, the rectangle. Yes, exactly. This is like a color picker application that's supposed to tell you the RGB codes on the screen. Um it does do that. Um mm -hmm. thankfully. Also notice that it has the like, it, well, it, this is like the, the, it doesn't look terrible in this one, absolutely, but it has the like GTK awful like fake header bar. Right. Like um, normally if, I, if you install a program, normally there's a library that you can install that uh, removes these. It of course doesn't work with a snap. Also, I think every time I drag the window, like the capture stops working properly. Uh, because I have like wobbly windows enabled. Uh, yeah, so that's everything you need to know about Snap, I think. Yeah, install and Snap, applications that they look like this. Snap was put together to simplify the installation for novice users, right? I think Steve, you told me that yesterday. So you get three kitchen sinks. Theoretically, those are simpler to do <laughs> for the for the non-technical of us. You know what's funny is that <laughs> no matter what era we're in, it takes like, I don't know, multiple tens of minutes to get everything configured, downloaded and configured, whether it's coming from the internet or some fixed media or whatever. It's like, I think this has been a constant. 
for like decades now. But I love the idea of just turning the power on and getting a prompt right away and, you know, having access to what you're working on. You know, I remember early, early on many years ago, they, there was a one computer that would allow you to do just that, Chip, and that was the Apple II. <laughs> yeah. And it did it perfectly. You could be booted up and running in, in about two or three seconds. Yep. Write it, write it a, a prompt. Yep. I have a lot of nostalgic feelings for that. And if I were to have a pleasant dream, it would be kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> Do you guys remember the Canon Cat? No. That was a, a computer you could just turn on immediately, and it was designed so that you would turn it on, and uh, the screen would have the same memory showing the screen what, what it was before you turn it off as it booted up. And they had a little card they could put on the Apple IIe that would make it into it. Oh. Well, the big, the biggest advantage the Apple II had, the first Apple II, was the fact that everything ran out of ROM. Uh, the the loading, you know, from memory, it was all already in ROM, so you didn't have to load anything. And yeah, that was, that's right. That was its big advantage, uh, at least in the beginning. Yeah, you could turn it on without any any drive attached, and it would come up right. with the prompt for AppleSoft Basic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I had a couple of Apple IIs. Would, would many of you guys in this day and age like something simple like that for doing embedded work on? I mean, that's, my thing with the yes. like, basic prompt is that it's kind of barely useful in most computers that have it. Like you can start writing a program, but it's like, oh. You know what though? The Apple II was actually highly usable. I But I saw what you're talking about on the Atari computers and others that it, the language was almost kind of gimmicky. It didn't really uh, let you get into the machine, but the Apple- I mean, the epitome I mean, of that is the Commodore, right? Where the, it's like- Oh, that no, was really flaky too, yeah. Like they have no machine specific commands. Like you just have to like write the register, which in in on, in some way tells you how the registers work, right? Right. Um, so it isn't as jarring when you do like actual programming without the basic interpreter. Yeah. The the trouble is this C sixty four seemed really unstable, and uh, I was programming it from an Apple II over this um, d downloader that I had built that was a card that plugged into the. Uh, Commodore 64 memory slot and it would, the Apple II would create a non-maskable interrupt and then uh, the card would bank in like an alternate ROM, which would then have a conversation with the Apple II. And the Apple II was an ultra stable machine. It just never crashed. It always kept working. And I just thought well, that's how computers are, you know, but everything that came after has been completely different. But uh, it would it would then uh, download from the Apple II, which would have like, I think we were using Merlin Assembler on the Apple II. And uh, we had it, there was a user mnemonic uh, that you could vector off to your own code that would be in, in, you know, resident in memory of the Apple II, and that would run the downloader. So just by assembling your code on the Apple II, it would download it and run it on the Commodore 64 completely bypassing all the flakiness. It was kind of like Docker or something. It was like a, it turned the C64 into a sandbox where you could just, who cares? Well, that's like a remote development kind of thing. I'm pretty sure they actually used something like that from most of like the commercial software that was developed. Like, a, like I'm pretty sure, I think they used like a CPM big box, like a really big CPM machine or something. Uh, when they were like making uh, the big commercial games at the time, because you can't, uh, if you're using all the memory to do funny stuff, um, you can't really run the assembler in it, right? Well, we had ways to move things onto disk files, so we could actually do a whole 64k image for the uh, Commodore 64, just piecewise. You know, assembling. What we could do is we would assemble, load a file, assemble it and have it orged for a certain memory range, but the OBJ would then sit somewhere else in the Apple II. Then it would shoot it down into the correct origin address of the 64, 
and we just set, do that, you know, in however many layers we need and load up the whole C64. So all, the Apple II was just super stable and it could hold all your source code and it would take just a few seconds for it to go through all the assembly and downloading and then your code runs on the 64. And it didn't matter that the 64 was flaky because in a few seconds you could just rewrite the whole thing's memory and make it run the new code and you never had to deal with the flakiness. What um, caught me, what brought me to Propeller uh, was seeing a video of tacos. Um, Wait, see, seeing a video of what? Doing the um, fourth. Oh, tacos, right, right, okay. Tacos, yeah. the fourth tournament. Yeah, fourth, right. Peter Jakaki. And that, that inspired me to go out and buy a Propeller. And uh, that, you know, it felt like, you know, you turn it on, you, you've you got a serial port in there, you've got a console right on the device, and you're developing code right there. Um, and it had tools for pushing, you know, doing your code, saving it off to SD card or putting it on flash for the next reboot. Um, and there's, um, with Eric's tools, um, it makes it easy to get into uh, fourth, and also there's a little tiny Lisp environment. I don't, I haven't spent much time with that either, but that's interesting. And you do that, you're coding right on the device itself, and I love both of those. Um, and uh, basic is easy and nostalgic, maybe, um, but I'm. I'm finally coming around to spin itself. Um, as I, I did some stuff in C last last year on B2, but um, yeah, spin is is pretty doggone simple, and uh, has features that are that seem well suited, obviously, for this this chip. So um, you finish your your tiny fonts there, so we can get the ID for spin right into the, the propeller. I'd give up a, a core to have the ID running in that in the, the console environment. Yeah, I'm in agreement with that. Does anybody have any idea? Ada, you might know. Uh, as far as SD support goes, there's also these USB memory sticks. And uh, they're like cheap and they're, uh, they're not as small as a micro SD card, but do you have any idea what the protocol is for communicating? Uh, no, but it's USB, right? Uh... It's USB and so I guess it would fall under mass storage class. Yeah, definitely. it's mass storage sure. class and it's it does something strange, um, but it's kind of like you, it's basically the same idea. You give it a command and it like streams your data back, except more junk because it's, it has to stream it in like 64 byte packets because any more than that, and like the bus throws a wobbly. Yeah, I noticed that when I identify, like when I'm working on the USB stuff, I can plug a USB stick in and go through the identification process. And it looks like it just has a 64-bit endpoint going one direction and a 64-bit endpoint, or 64 byte, I'm talking, I mean 64 byte. 64 bytes going one direction and 64 bytes going another, and that, at least initially, is the whole interface. I, I don't think know as far as it bytes. works, I think it's like, it basically actually used it as like a, like a command, you know, like a connection, like a, like a, basically the packets, I think, don't exist at the um, protocol level. Like how they right. do for the uh, hit. Like hit always starts um, gives you the same sort of packet at the beginning, but I think that one actually like has some sort of more yes. streaming sort of just, interface. It just operates the interface through those bidirectional endpoints. It does. I don't, that's what I, it looks like. It must be doing. Like there is no protocol per se at the USB level. It's all only only the data exchange through the endpoints, and then the 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 protocol for speaking to the thing, you know, at the file level is really transacted over uh, 
over those endpoints. It has to be that way, it looks to me. I'm just writing a bug report to Eric because I was trying to put something on the screen because I don't know, I'm bored. And it turns out something's busted and like the compiler doesn't compile the thing anymore that it used to compile. Ah. Uh. Hey, John McPhailin, would USB memory sticks works, work in your app or do you really need the micro SD card? It's not really, no. Oh, he doubts they would be fast enough because he's reading a lot of audio. Yeah, I was just investigating the throughput to both USB, you know, put it out to a USB disk or something, but SD card uh, appears to be faster. Okay, even in even in SPI mode? I don't know about that. Uh, well, SPI I was mode looking gives at just a like... USB... 20 or, something uh, uh, megahertz, even with the like slightly gank setup that's on the uh, boards to make the booting uh, work properly. And uh, oh, yeah, just by the fact it runs at 20 megahertz, whereas USB is only going to run at 12, right? Yeah, and of course, it doesn't have to chunk it up into like uh, 64 byte packets with the extra overhead, it's doing full 55, 12 byte packets, which is you know the actual sector size. And also, he is. Uh, what? What? Why is that a back tick? What is anything? Uh. I watch um, Doug here, who's in the shop, and he has he's building industrial robots for customers and. He's putting together systems using Alan Bradley as kind of central control means. And then he has all these other, uh, a lot of stuff these days is like Ethernet and power over Ethernet. And uh, there's some other protocol, but I see him struggling with a lot of this complexity where he, the other day he, he has this robot, it's like this $30,000 seven axis robotic arm. And it's really nice. And it, it works over some kind of protocol called I can't remember. It's it's not exactly Ethernet. It's something a little different, but it uses an RJ45. So he had to buy this little tiny thousand dollar converter box to go between the Allen Bradley EtherCAT, maybe it is, or something. And yep. and and then the protocol that this robot uses. And then there's all this issue of configuring and the documentation's kind of sparse and it's like everything is just so tenuous you know i wonder like he'll he'll figure it out and he'll get this machine built but it just seems like the whole thing is just very tenuous it's like kind of delicate and hopefully he gets it configured and it just keeps running but i wonder can you imagine having problems in the field with these kinds of things and how i mean it's he has to sit there and look at it you know all day long to make progress on it but I don't know. The way things are going these days, it just seems complex. And I, I wonder if like young people have any, because, you know, a lot of us are, are, you know, over 50 and we remember things that used to be, and that informs our sensibilities. But I, but it seems like young people don't even, uh, they don't have any expectation that anything be simple. It seems to me, do you guys know otherwise? It's hard for me to think about what what they think and try and or how they think. I really don't know. It's kind of mysterious to me. Uh, they don't I don't know, know anything either. else. People, people just like I don't know. I mean, the problem is that no one expects it to be simple because, um, or rather, they're not aware of the um, that there's a simpler way of doing things because. You know, most people these days, they learn programming, like either like with JavaScript and like a web browser with like Python and no and never look at the sort of entire machinery that exists underneath that. 
right it's all closed and i'm probably yeah. told oh it's it's like scary you have to like oh you have to like allocate the memory it's and then, then like free it or oh, oh no it's like it's like scary and you don't want to do it we have the new way that only like slower and worse <laughs> Because Jeff, I think bit, that I think sort of... that the uh, years of experience and uh, being around for quite a while and working in this in uh, this this kind of field sometimes gives you um, uh, the, the perspective for sure that the young kids don't have, but also sometimes that experience can get in your way. Right. Of uh, being afraid to jump into doing something new. When 20 years or 30 years earlier, you would have just took it on, you know, easily. But because you have that perspective, it makes you very cautious. Right. Well, like Stephen Morocco is a good example of someone who just pushes right in. His career was spent, you know, maintaining complex systems and developing complex things. So he's not he, he's not timid when it comes to this stuff. But <laughs> It's overwhelming to me. It's, and I, I wonder, uh, I just, would, would people even like something simple or are we past the era where that would have mattered? I don't even know. I Most people say, don't know it exists. I would say we're not past it, not at all. I mean, to have an IDE, okay, with a certain uh, framework, pre-built and, and, and deliverable from your company would be helpful to get your product out there in more places and also give you more capabilities and open it up to more people, especially young people that wouldn't have otherwise invested any time in it. So I don't think we're past it at all. I think we're not past. Um... The only other social group I hang out with, there are lots of, well, young and old people, but they're um, still building add-on cards for uh, Amigas and <laughs> still running Amigas. And um, somebody released uh, last a few months ago, new in a box, uh, a Atari 2600 cartridges for new games for the Atari 2600 there's there's people out there that still appreciate that um, I'm looking to though build future stuff on that same simplicity now um, uh, yeah I won't go further but uh, we're not past it there's 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 plenty of it's not the billion dollar market maybe but uh there's a steady need for it for sure and i think we can open some eyes if we do it right yeah I, uh, been, sorry go ahead jim uh, i've been working with a number of younger engineers and i've been relatively shocked at how much they're using chat gpt to do really hard things. I mean, things, this one guy was uh, trying to make a Bluetooth low energy beacon and be able to tell other Bluetooth devices that are in the room. He had no idea how to do this. Simply asked GP, Chat GPT to do it. It came up with the code, ran the code, got an error, put it back in, to chat GPT and say, what caused this error? Chat GPT apologized to him that he had forgot to put in such and such. The guy wrote probably two or 300 lines of code, got this thing running, and he only had to modify two lines of that code, he said. The wow. whole rest of the code came from chat GPT. Um, that means so that someone on the internet guys, has written that code before. It basically just replaced code examples use, from elsewhere uh, on the internet. Use, I've seen this. I use perplexity AI quite a bit. And um, there's not a trove of um, spin code out there. And in some cases, I just give it the documentation, point it at the documentation, and uh, have it come up with stuff that uh, 
get me going down a path pretty easily, pretty quickly. There's and there's some things just straight up uh, C plus plus on the desktop or on Haiku operating system. I use it generates that flawlessly. Um, if you use Google's machine, know it's very hard to get it not to give you Python or JavaScript. But uh, I have it give me spin code and uh, of things I'm pretty sure isn't out there right now. It's useful. What these guys uh, tell me, Chip, is that ChatGPT will never replace real programmers, but it will replace programmers who don't know how to use AI. Certainly not, because right. if everyone uses that, if no one ever comes up with anything new and they'll all just write the same code forever. Like, what people don't understand is that uh, this technology is like built to basically deceive you. Like, it's like they're trying, well, perhaps not intentionally built, but basically does this. Because it interfaces to you, like, as it's as if it's like a person, it like pretends to be a person, right. you attribute it more intelligence than it actually has. What it basically does is it predicts what the next word is going to be based on some statistical model that usually ends up being like a strange sort of variant on uh, something that already exists. Like I've tried using it for programming. It doesn't really give you anything that you couldn't find with a Google search, except now it's like bad and wrong. Like I tried well, using it to write like a triangle uh, fill function. It gave me a triangle outline function first. I think another attempt, it gave me like a triangle fill function that doesn't work properly because it's like messed the math up. Like this is very basic. Well, but there yeah, are actually a lot of different examples on this on the internet. And, it's and it doesn't me... give you the stuff wholesale. You use it like a no, it programmer. Gives you, it gives and, you like and the... you sit there and communicate the problem is with it gives you forth. like a shit version of the example of this of the same code that you can find on the internet. It's not actually useful. Uh, it's really yeah, well, it maybe it doesn't work for you, but uh, it's, also, it's, it's of course me... built on basically stealing. Like it's, it's like that infinite money exploit that they always want, where they do nothing, but sort of make money off of something someone else does. And that's basically like the epitome of it, right? Like what do the fuckers well, that of yeah, AI do? They do nothing. They this. just sit around and, and basically put money into the thing, and then there's more money coming out. It's absolutely mental. Yeah, there's a lot of copyright issues with ChatGPT. I mean, it's a, a, a walking copyright issue. Yeah. And yeah, there's a big I've... problem when they want to use the right like scripts for movies or do pictures. Yeah, there's an issue with that. Yeah, you know, um, there was, have you guys heard of the show called The Lincoln Lawyer? Mm -hmm. It was on, I don't know if it was a Netflix produced thing. That was a movie, right? Well, it was a series, I think, about this lawyer who drove a Lincoln. And I think all of his files were in like the trunk. Or I, I didn't see it, but it came to our attention that um, this show had featured a president of a company called Parallax and the guy murdered his wife on the show and Parallax was a tech company and he used a drone to like hide evidence of his wife's murder. I don't know if he took it out to sea and dropped it or whatever, but um, the strange thing is, you know, my brother Ken is president of Parallax, a tech company. His wife had recently passed away from cancer and uh, we make drones. And uh, some lawyer said, you know, you guys might have like a, some kind of defamation case here because they're taking your company name and they are showcasing it as, now, I don't think AI could have ever known that my brother's wife had passed away, right? But they could deduce that there's a tech company called Parallax, it has a president, they make drones. Anyway, this was like one of the episodes was about this situation. But I just it just makes me wonder, could AI have like, could they have been just querying AI for story ideas? And then it just kind of pulls together some information and says, without even thinking to change names or anything, and 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 just 
amalgamates these details and says, okay, here's this, and then writes a script for it. Because it's just resynthesizing extant information, right? That's all it's doing. Possibly, but if if you try to actually get it to write like a script, it will just give you incoherent nonsense, basically. Yeah, and it has limit. Well, the when I was playing with it, because I used it for some... And of course, you shouldn't really... Like, it's 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 very... Basically, don't do it. It's kind of disgusting. Basically, don't do what? Don't even try to let it uh, pretend to, like, write a script or something. It's kind of intellectually dishonest in its uh, existence. It's kind of... It's kind of like trying to summon the devil. It, you shouldn't do it, maybe. Right. Bad oh, yeah. yeah. It's gonna it's gonna pull things that have have been made in the past. That's what it works from. I want to show. Okay, I can. Oh, let's see. Can I get a good picture of this? There's a crazy thing we saw. Let me see if I can get this thing blown up enough. At the end of movies, they have a disclaimer saying that none of these, you know, characters or points in the movie are based on real people or real right. things. I'm loading a picture. If I can get the right one to come on, let's see. How do we do this? This was something we someone pointed out to us on the internet. It's like, how does this stuff even happen? Uh, come on, where's the right picture? Oh, here we go. I got to scroll around just a minute. Okay. Oh, 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 hold on. Oh, no, 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 no. Let me back it up a little bit. So there's this yacht for sale for a couple million bucks. I'm going to share my screen really quick. Okay, here we go. So this is rather curious. You guys see that? We do, yeah. It's like, how does this happen? I mean, we yeah. don't really care, right? But that's our logo that we designed back in 1987. And it was put on this yacht. Wow. Who knows how? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's not us. I don't think they're trying to be us they probably have no idea we exist but maybe it's in your name yeah well i mean it's the name and our exact logo you know it's like a geometric replica of our logo it's your logo copyrighted uh, chip uh i don't know that we ever pursued that i think it kind of would have been maybe we we didn't make any like no trademarks. Trademark, trademark effort but, and we don't really care, you know, but it's just sort of weird. Like, how does that happen? Mystery. Maybe someone just had a book of images and they're showing the client, well, I got all these ideas. And he goes, that looks cool. Let's let's use that. It's probably generated by Chad GPT. Well, yeah, this is a few years ago, probably five years ago. Could be this is an upcoming uh, episode of Lincoln Lawyers where the guy throws his wife off the boat. Oh um, yeah, <laughs> maybe so. Yeah, who knows? It's just all weird. But yeah, but I've used Chat GPT. I kind of think it's it's you, you Google search has become worthless. You know, it it mainly shows you what it wants to show you, regardless of what you search for. By products, by products. Yeah, yeah. Like oftentimes, it, I'm searching for something, it just wants to. to sell me things I, I don't want to buy something i want information right on the internet well that's what chat gpt is is good for i mean it, it can it can suss out details from a lot of information like i asked it about rootstock compatibilities for fruit trees and stuff that would be kind of hard you know odd questions but it could come up with some stuff that would kind of lead to conclusion and the real power there is that it can sometimes pull something out that you maybe wouldn't have searched for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It starts to show you all the ancillary issues, and then you can kind of clue into what else might be of importance that you should be looking for, which is a lot different than what a search engine does. Yeah, I think there's some minor value there, but the problem is that currently everyone's like trying to treat it as like an everything engine, 
uh, that can actually give you reliable information as a primary source, which kind of it doesn't. Like it's very easy to show this with like really stupid trick questions. But the problem is you don't know when you ask a question if it's stupid, right? Yeah. Um, so you will randomly get nonsense. Like people who do, uh, who actually write a lot of software and that's, that gets used a lot. They often have like weird bug requests where the people say, oh no, the, 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 the chat GPT told me how to do it like this, but it doesn't work. The function doesn't exist. Yeah. And it's like, okay. Um, and that's it. And like people actually do that and then probably get banned from the bug tracker. Did I tell you guys how I might have told this, but Doug, who works here, he, you know, has to write bids for these like automation projects for making medical equipment and everything. And um, he had this job where he had to define, well, in the quote, he was, had, they had been so far discussing using a hook and loop system for a disposable sanding pad that would go on a robotic arm. And then he figured, well, the hook and loop stuff is expensive and it's consumable. So why don't we just make a system that can uh, take a piece of raw form uh, sandpaper and then wrap it around, uh, you know, a block and then crimp, clamp the ends so it's stable and then use that. And then we can then we can just cycle through stacks of very inexpensive commodity sandpaper rather than use this expensive hook and loop system. So he, he was talking about this in this bid and uh, it was kind of, I knew what he was saying, but, you know, in, you know, writing this stuff is not his strong suit. He can, he can do it, but you know, it's not, not what he's best at. So I saw there were some little errors in it and whatnot. So we asked chat GPT just on a whim to clean it up. And not only did chat GPT, um, completely make it like, you know, correct all punctuation and spelling and everything. It actually sussed out the difference between the hook and loop and the commodity sandpaper system. And it, and, and it realized that there was this, this thing that needed to be explained in two different ways, the hook and loop and the commodity paper. And it recognized, or I don't know if it didn't really, I don't know. It's just resynthesizing extant knowledge and text, but it actually like rewrote this, the the um, bid so that it perfectly explained the difference between the two systems and what the advantage was of the new proposed way, which Doug hadn't done really. But that kind of was pretty useful, you know. I didn't know if it would do that, but uh, it it. It did more than I thought it would do anyway. The problem is when you start actually trying to rely on the fact that it does this very quickly, because then dumb bullshit uh, starts creeping its way in and you don't notice. Because you, you see something that's okay, you see something that's okay, and you look away and, oh, there's, a, there's the dumb bullshit. Right. Like, uh, we, we, we bought a sewing machine in your one, like uh, a few months ago anyways. And someone seems to have used some sort of uh, language model on that description for that. And it goes from talking about uh, thread tension to talking about voltage. So in German, those are the same word, right? And in a lot of lang other languages as well. And then claims that it requires like uh, 110 volts power, which is like bizarre. It doesn't. Also, the actual machine is like utterly delightful it has a motor it has a like a foot pedal it has an incandescent bulb and that's all the electronics mm. actually delightful mm. well we're probably not going to put the uh, chat gpt inside a p2 so maybe we don't need to worry about it no we I can mean, all just probably make it. like a probably make like a shit version uh that that's like barely coherent and takes like five minutes to uh, to do something, but that's probably more interesting. Yeah, I view the chat GTP and all these AI things like BART as tools. They're never good or great, uh, but they give me a huge head start. I mean, it, they, they have saved me days of work sometimes. Yeah. 
That's undeniable. But you have to you have to read it. You have to understand it yourself. If you don't, you are going to get into trouble like you're suggesting. Exactly. That's the, that's the thing. You can't really trust anything that comes out of there. And the problem is that sometimes checking the thing is harder than just doing it from, from first place. I kind of see chat GPT as like kind of a brain amplifier. I mean, you have to know you the, the better you can query it, the better results you can get out of it. And if you and if you could recognize the BS, like Frank said, that's important. Um, but it can be kind of like an amplifier of sorts if, if you know what you're doing. I think one of one of us in the forum mentioned earlier the pair programming. The um, those of us that have worked in the pair programming environment really appreciate the different perspectives that people have as we're sitting next to each other trying to work through things. And you end up having you end up with the ability to move through the idea space, possible solution space, much more quickly. And yes. I find I find that the copilot under uh, uh, under VS Code is actually allowing me. Um, I spent an hour going through um, experimenting with Node.js libraries for doing some things, and I had Copilot investigate, generate code for three different sets of libraries, and tested the working code to see how it would generate. And I went through three different examples in less than an hour, and I could never do that on my own just researching with Google. And so these were these were built running examples and proven correct. So it is amplifying very nicely. I am also seeing where it can go badly awry and you have to you have to watch very carefully and put it back on course when it goes off course in your querying. But the amplification is well worth it to me. Is there a chat GPT plugin for VS Code? Uh, absolutely. And that's it's called Copilot, and it's licensed, so you pay for it. Uh, but no, it's not licensed. You pay for it, and they don't pay the people whose code it rips off. Okay, fine. But you understand what I'm saying. You have to pay also like even if you pay for it, uh, they actually lose money, which is kind of funny. Anyway, my point is, it's functional. It works, and it's it's serving me really well in the areas where I'm choosing to use it. So. Different experiences, different people, right? Yeah. Um, Nicholas said it would be good to ask it to complete the P2 hardware and assembler manuals. I was hoping I could I could feed it our manuals and ask it to write code to check the veracity of what's written already. But it, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem to be the way the model works. It's not so amenable to that. Also, they have limitations on how much you can feed it, at least on the free version. I don't know if, if they have a... Yeah, I use Perplexity AI, um, the paid version, and I can upload, and I have with Parallax documents, um, it, in the prompt, ask a question about a document you send up there, and it will read the document and pull out the bits that you're looking for um, and synthesize stuff from that document, um, stuff that I would do. It's not stealing code. You put the document there <laughs> trying to teach us how to use it. So um, it's, uh, I tried a bunch of the tools and I'm not selling this at all, but Perplexity AI as a standalone uh, tool has been dynamite. And if you don't like the co-pilot answer it gives you, you can select Say, have another engine rewrite it, have another model rewrite it. And uh, that's pretty interesting too. It gets different perspectives. I've, uh, it's turned out three different approaches to doing something in the P2 that I wouldn't have gotten, wouldn't have understood from all of the, the pin options there. It's turned out useful stuff for me. Interesting. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you take the uh, manuals chip and feed those into the actual large language model itself? Would it, wouldn't you approach it that way? And then have it, then it would be useful with the different languages that we do use, like SPIN. Right. Yeah, but I, I think that the way at least ChatGPT has been working, 
you can um you're not really changing its 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 data that it was trained on you're just having a conversation with it so it it's only con it contextualizes everything to that conversation and then but it, so maybe it could learn during that conversation something but uh but i don't know i mean that really that's not when it synthesizes when it synthesizes new stuff how different from that how different is that from when it was trained being trained on the data is that not new like some new layer of temporary training you're putting on top of it no or not really it's really just you have like the past thousand something words or something their inputs into the neural network it does it's like voodoo or whatever and uh then it comes out with the uh with some sort of likelihoods of what's the next uh word that it's going to print out and then it sort of semi-randomly picks between those and right. then it repeats that process yeah and it uses a neural net to, to uh cut down on the time to check the search space no it's it's just the neural net that does it yeah but well, i mean thing. it's it's trying to find the most it, it finds a reasonably probable word without spending a lot of time searching what a normal computer would have to do right well that's sort of it's kind of interesting that it works at all because i know and you can kind of see this um you can kind of see this happen in real time when it sort of picks a bad word right when it picks a bad word once that word is then in the context memory for the next word that it generates yes, yes. so if when it, if it goes off the rails it just goes off the rails it doesn't it doesn't it has no filter it's like when you're drunk i like to use it um you can have it generate your tests first uh of a function you're trying to make for example um and the test code is is dead simple so you can recognize that it's correct and the compiler will compile it and so you know it's functional code and then you have it work on generating a function the content of the function that that test code is going to test um and there, there'll be some back and forth until you get it uh doing what you want and, um you wrote the whole thing yourself but we're not anyway uh with a compiler you've always got that uh tool uh to understand is the content correct um if you have it write the test function first um then you'll know that the whole function is correct and uh, you can build up from there, getting complex stuff out of a machine that doesn't know what it's doing. Yes. So is you, when you talk to Perplexity, are you, you've paid, so there's some portal by which you, when you have a conversation with it, you can upload files to it and then query it afterwards, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah that's, that's what I, I keep conversations going. I'll go back and revisit. I had new thoughts about something I was talking about a month ago. I'll go back into that discussion. That, that context is still there and continue with more questions on it. And, um, yeah, explore spaces and, and things. I didn't, I didn't know the concepts so I didn't know sometimes and get into. And, oh, there's it's a new keyword that's pulled out. And perplexity always gives you the exact links that it used to oh. pull together the content you're looking at. Um, so so uh, I would have, I, I don't browse, I don't, that's my way into the internet now. I'm on the internet all the time. I've not seen one ad or one front page of anything in months. Because it drives me right down to the content in the, in the PDF doc in the obscure backwaters of the internet and pulls that out. And that is content that was put there for me to learn from and shows me, gives me a link to it so I can go in and double check. Um, 
And yeah, I, I uh, have lots of long discussions with it. I'm learning new stuff and uh, I do it a lot for getting into new parts or new products or new, well, my long, uh, um, I wish I had some to show for my ADC, my uh, acoustic analysis stuff uh, that we were talking about earlier on the forum. But that taught me a whole lot about that and taught me where to go to look for more information to understand it. Um, Perplexity has the option to, to hook up Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha on the back. And that's a system that they've been cooking since the 90s, collecting, you know, verifying the data uh, all the physics data and the math and the functions, and that produces real math. Uh, it's not guessing. It's not just a language model. So if I need to do real math, I go there. Interesting. Yeah, my thought was if we could if we could know that our documentation is like sufficiently uh, in you know, has enough information to let any, to let an AI anyway, write code from it, then the goal is make the documentation sufficient that people could then leverage AI to utilize the chip. Because I suppose there's going to be a lot of people in the future who are just going to, that's going to be their first go-to is AI to make some kind of code. Yeah, but how much code yeah. is that? You mean how a, much? Yeah, how much code would you need to be an effective training model for <clears throat> for ChatGPT? I mean, there's a lot of Java code out there. There's a lot of Python. No, I don't. Yeah, no. I mean that the documentation would be sufficient to allow an a, a AI to write code from without a whole lot of code base that it can look at. It needs the code yeah, base. Yeah, with it's, one it's example, if, if you put in documentation, it writes more documentation. If you put in code, it writes more code. An example uh -huh. of each of these functions being used. Um, that's how I learn best when I'm looking in documentation. I'll see here's all the um, here's all the parameters, etc. But just a little five line snip of here it is used in context after every function is great for me to learn by and uh, and. I've given, I've uploaded docs to languages that have much less resource out there than uh, even Spin, and uh, it's produced working code for me from, See, from that's, a instruction yeah. manual. That's what I'd hope would be possible. It, it isn't, doesn't need to find. Oh, somebody's done this whole algorithm just the way you want it. It doesn't need to find that and copy it from some unknown, um, some GPL place or something. Uh, it, it's, I'm fabricating it off of language stuff, documents that I know don't live out in the internet. Mm -hmm. So it's really doing what you'd want AI to do. It does what I want it to do, and it doesn't do the whole thing. It's a back and forth like a pair programmer, but it amplifies my abilities and lets me pick up projects that um, I've, I've had on the shelf for years, knowing that, oh, well, if I sat down, I just don't have a month to block out to tackle this new thing. But I can make headway and see if I want to explore it more in, in a weekend. Um, make some real functional progress and say, is this going to be worth it or not? Uh, things I wouldn't have attempted until this tool came along and amplified my abilities. You could test it out with P1 manual, put the P1 manual in there and see if it can write P1 code. Yeah. I'm going to sign up for perplexity then. It sounds interesting because that that's, You've gotten past the barrier I encountered with chat GPT and just kind of moved on to other things. It's I, a year ago, I put the same half dozen prompts into a half a dozen models 
and got Spurrier's response. Uh, in May, I did it again, and they were all better, but perplexity stood way out um, because of the it gives me links and it's hooked a Wolfram. And it, it was a tool before it was trendy. Yeah. Um, and they, they give you the links and the resources to back stuff up. Um, and the com- keeping your conversations is huge that I can go back and revisit things. Shannon, how much does it cost? 20 bucks a month. It paid for itself day one for me. <laughs> yeah. Um, you were talking about code bases, if I may interject a little bit. Um, Copilot has an inline mode as well. And so while I'm writing spin code, it's actually um, helping me with comments and it sees my entire code base and it's actually generating code and method calls and things like this from its understanding of my code base. And it's running about 60% correct. And so uh, that's an improvement. You know, it's, uh, I'm enjoying its ability to do that and certainly uh, documenting methods and things like this is actually, it's quite helpful in doing that. Um, it's, it seems in spin, it's helpful in TypeScript, it's dramatically helpful. Uh, that's probably the size of the code base available, but it's uh, just letting you know there are successes out there too in spin. Hey, Steven, yeah. would you want to show any like little example of metamorphoses it's done on stuff you're working on? Uh, I, I don't think I'm ready to show any of that yet, but it's, um, I can generate, uh, I can have it study code and transform that code and annotate with comments as it's making the transforms with values in multiple bases, number bases, and things like this, um, all on the fly. And so, uh, including keeping original comments from the source that it's transforming. And so it's, it's quite fascinating to see how rich it is and how quickly I can make the changes and improve uh, documentation. And I'm doing this as I'm moving from language to language too. Um, and so it's, it's, it's fascinating how supportive it is. Um, but, you know, you do have to pay attention to the accuracy and you have to pay attention to what it's actually uh, putting out there, but keep it on track and it's quite, it's quite amplifying what you're trying to do. I'm still learning every day. Uh, my son actually runs a business in this world, um, a high dollar consulting business and it's online and uh, allows you to have an executive assistant, if you will, um, from your phone. Um, and uh, it's fascinating. And, and what we're seeing in other coders that are using this kind of support that I'm talking to in clubs and things that I belong to, it's all about your ability to refine your questioning technique and um, how you ask it to do. And so the people that are more successful are those that have refined how they ask the queries. And so it's, it's fun to watch. There's, there's a lot to, getting over it. There's a lot to learning. Um, you're learning a new language. You're communicating. I call it my savant toddler. Um, because sometimes you're surprised. Holy cow! Well, look what it understood. Look what my look what my thing understood. And uh, oh, it, it understood to do this. And um, and I get I get better. Um, differences in you know commanding it to generate this or write this or find me examples or um, I'll have different different ways it comes back and it, it, it's a learning process it took it took a couple of weeks for me to get to understand the subtleties and start turning it the way I wanted it I think what amuses me is when I reflect on uh, being paired with younger students coming directly out of college as a paired programming environment 
and it's some of the same responses. <laughs> it's like, you're telling me to do what? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it would be good if someday all this kind of tech could remove the drudgery of implementation because a lot of my thinking is um, wrapped up in how to implement things. And uh, if you could just feed it like the manual and have it deal with that, it'd be like the difference between digging ditches and having a ex excavator. Well, the problem is that if you just be, do you ever notice how your idea that you have in your head when you start writing something and the thing that actually comes out, they're usually quite different. Yeah, well, that's like the, the idea process. in your head is 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 completely uncooked. You have to actually do well, it to make the you're, thing. You're and I mean, if you want you... to, I mean, you, at some point maybe the computer can do it for you. But like, what is the point if the computer can do it? Then the computer already did it, probably. Like, there's a complete lack of point to all of this. Yeah, I do anything. Well, everything I work on, I start off with an idea, but as the implementation proceeds, it can go in a whole kind of different direction. And it's always for the better. Um, it would seem like the worst job to have to just, you know, follow some fixed spec that would have all kinds of things that you know aren't very efficient. You're yeah, that to... usually leads to hot shit. Yeah. Because as I've worked on everything, it's metamorphosed as I'm working on it. It turns out better. And I, and I really didn't have much idea at the outset how it was going to go. But it always turns out better as you go through the implementation steps. So is any, like, for the, you, you know, we've focused a lot on, like, how we, whether it can, can write code or so. How about optimizing code or so? Would that, is it good at that? I've pointed it at the Haiku operating system source code repository and uh, ask it uh, what it would do to uh, correct efficiencies in the network stack. I didn't tell it where in there or, or what the issues were. And it came back pretty promptly. Um, there's like 30,000 files in there. It picked out particular uh, classes and particular functions that had issues in them that could be corrected and, and suggested how to correct them. Wow. Cool. But did, he, yeah. did it just bullshit that up or is that an actual thing that... I think like, he knew what the... No, I, I know the source code too enough and uh, work with it. And yes... Uh, I didn't go implement all the issues there, but uh, they were reasonable suggestions based on what I know about what's in the functions already. Yeah, well, so he asked it, it, it would take me all, all afternoon to in a few wander. seconds, then it probably did nothing. That's the thing. Like, well, it would take me all afternoon then to do the same amount of nothing that it did. Yeah, Shannon knew what he was, he knew what the weakness was. He was testing to see if perplexity would would figure the same thing out, and it did. And, and to know that it was not just wandering through what it knew of the universe, but it was looking at the stack of source that I told it to look at. Yeah, that's, and I would hope in, it would In do. my profile, in my perplexity profile, I've got uh, pointers to, uh, those links I stuck in there, I say, um, I tend to work in this operating system with these languages and propeller and P2 manuals are linked in there. And I do a lot of as SQLite, SQLite. And it will tell you when it's processing. It'll go out and search. It'll tell me sometimes I'm looking in your documents or I'm looking out on the web. And it will automatically go first look, come up with new searches to drill deeper. And it'll do that about six times before it comes back and starts um, 
generating anything. Sometimes it'll stop right away and ask you a question, clarifying where to go next. Or do you want me to drill into this or that? And uh, then it will produce something, and it's it's a conversation, um, and it really is. And it'll tell you if it's going into your profile, which you've linked specifically for it to to uh, understand and communicate with you as a proficient coder, if you are, or if you tell it you are. Um, some things I say I'm weak in, and it'll explain things to me differently. That's what I would hope it would do. That sounds great. You know, I had another I thought or so like that for, you know, like the documentation or so, well, you know, like the most precise documentation here is the Verilog. So would it be able to, you know, digest the Verilog and create a manual yeah, yeah, that's that a cool way. idea. <laughs> yeah. And, and it might take several iterations. The first time through the Verilog, it will get, get one step of abstraction above it. And timings and inputs and outputs and whatnot. And then feed that back in, if that's correct. Feed that back in and get another layer of abstraction above that. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a cool idea. Because I have to go back there sometimes and kind of look to, because I don't even remember. And I realize I'm sometimes documenting things only partially because there was assumptions like that I made when I wrote the code, but it means that other things would be possible too. But I didn't intend for that. But I, I don't really document that because it wasn't the intent. Well, I don't know what you're going to do. Is it, we can make it a hit house or? Yeah. But that's a cool idea, James. Maybe it could make like, you know, then someday someone can say, okay, given this complete behavioral description, can you make Verilog code for this? But if you have that a behavioral description, is that not already Verilog? Like, this is exactly what I was talking about. You sort of brain rot yourself into thinking that it's an everything engine. Right, well, it's better. I know what you're saying about GPT, but what, and I, that's been my experience too, but what Shannon's describing is kind of something that I was hoping GPT would be, but kind of isn't really. I suppose this stuff's just going to get better and better and it'll become like amplifiers that people use to make their brains be able to handle and do a lot more. Hmm. I have to basically admit my that experience I've has been that it's basically useless in... at actually doing anything. And even if it was, like I, I said this earlier, like why you know, if some if the computer can just do it, then it probably already did it. And like it's it's pretty pointless if you just tell it to do it. Like, okay, to put it more simply, when I do something, I do it because of the process. The outcome is never interesting, right? Like Look at any, any of the thing I, things I do. It's never about the outcome. It's always about the, the doing the thing, right? Yeah. And that's why it's yeah. completely incompatible with the way I work. Because if you didn't no, do I it, get then that what's too. the point? I understand. But a lot of stuff I've built that I don't care to use in the end. The fun was the building of them. I certainly do uh, understand it and agree with that. But also, uh, nobody pays me. To do that <laughs> well what james for my was, own enjoyment from what james was saying what if you fed it the verilog and then you fed it all the compiler source code and let it write the documentation for the whole system maybe it would need to be steered a little bit to understand more things from more of a intentional perspective because it's it may not glean it's not going to glean that probably but it will get the functionality. That documentation correct. would probably be shit to you. Yeah, yeah. But you can you can hone it and because people need to read things that are from an intention standpoint, right? Because why would you do this? Why would you use that right. instruction? 
and the, and it's not going to glean that, but it could come at it from that perspective, possibly. After it, the problem is that every word that you put in the documentation is kind of important because it's like a statement of fact, right? Yeah, yeah. You can't just put um, you can't just have like a weird sentence that implies something. You have to, it has it needs very precise language. Like, please don't do this to the actual documentation. I will actually like leave and go somewhere else to I don't know. Where do they still have documentation that exists? Do we have any more P2 subjects? I don't know. I wasn't doing anything over the holidays and also my computer broke down. Blame. Well, if Samsung. we were doing development right on the P2, it'd be set. I mean, I could, I could just do it on my laptop, but uh, uh, I don't know. It's just less convenient and doesn't have like all the files on it. And would you guys, if the tools ran on the chip, would you guys be willing to plug a monitor and keyboard into it? Or is that kind of like, eh, I don't want to give up my... No, absolutely. I, I mean, would. I have uh, a monitor uh, and keyboard can... permanently attached here, but... In fact, uh, you know, I that's been going through my head for a week. And... <laughs> well, so, Shannon... Uh, I you, absolutely you... would do that. Oh, you would do that. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, because I know Stephen, I'm, I'm kind of cooking up a little test bench because as as I'm building things, I'm kind of, I'm using one half of the pins to feed the other half of the pins, the inputs, and and then am, am I writing the code to produce the output or take on the input? And I'm just coming up with, uh, yes, it's a wild idea, but uh, I can't afford a national instrument setup. Um, and lab view and all that, but um, there's a lot of stuff I I can imagine doing here with a a like a, a bench test equipment with a scope right on it and a rotary knob menus for some things, but also keyboard and display for a, a console to give it commands and write code and to script. The, I'm feeding these signals into my device under test, and it's producing some outputs, which I'm reading on the other side, and displaying on the scope, and logging all the inputs and outputs in a repeatable way so we can um, to do development and document uh, complete tests. Um, yeah, I'm... I'm um, here sitting amongst <laughs> amongst P2s right now, kind of uh, working on that. So I'd like a USB uh, keyboard. Yeah, okay, keyboard I'll get that well. done. Um, I mean, I already have a USB keyboard thing. It works very well. What if what if we could someday have like just a P2 that you could plug a monitor keyboard into, but it also had like Wi-Fi. So it could talk to the uh, perplexity site and it, it would have like enough of a uh, relationship that it could, it could invoke on its side to have perplexity take like, you know, human style requests and then write code and make it happen on the chip. Well, I was getting there. That's next month. Well, that yeah. works until it like makes a mistake and overwrites the uh, interpreter or whatever it is. You yes, um, except yeah. I don't. I'm hesitant to hook things to the web, and I kind of want to put an an ESP32 module on there, maybe as a go between. Right, right. And uh, just, just, I if it, yeah. Um, P2 if you got to be connected to the net, uh, network. Yeah, well, the P2 is unknown. It's not really a candidate for attack or anything. It's just like a, right. nobody knows no. what it is. No, I, I get that, too. I'm not. But, but uh, you put it in a product, 
and you try to get it uh, certified in certain lab tests as a secure, and they don't know what it is, and you end up having to uh, do a whole lot of uh, security testing where, I mean, it's <laughs> clearly, if you don't give it access or there's not a shell into it, uh, an HTTP accessible shell um, or SSH or whatever, uh, there's no risk, but uh, there's no standard practice, standard industry practice you can point to that will get them off your back and <laughs> until right. they've proven that it's, uh, it's not a risk. When I turned on that new little computer I have uh, for doing the TypeScript development, of course, the first thing it wants is connect me to the Internet. There's stuff I got to do. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, what if we didn't have that? Would it would the computer not have ever would it had windows on it, but it, would it not would it never come up? I don't know. I don't know. You can uh, some things install may Linux not. without internet. Um it, it, it even has all like the drivers tablet. installed. Oh. Like you don't even need to like have the like Windows is very stupid when you plug something in, it has to go to the internet and download the driver. Um, in the Linux kernel, they actually have like same coding standards. So all the drivers for every device that ever existed are just kind of on your computer at all times. And they take up like 15 megabytes or something, or it's like 50. Yeah. Like all together. I installed, I, I made this like an Ubuntu USB boot thing. And I, so what I did is the, the hard drive on this, it has Windows 11, but it's partitioned so that one terabyte is for Windows and one terabyte is Ubuntu. And then I can select in the BIOS which system I want to boot into. So I have it booting into Ubuntu now. So it's, it's, it is a lot more efficient. Steven and I were working on this yesterday quite a bit and we were loading things onto it. And the whole process is a lot tight. Uh, well, it's verbose, but it's not as crazy and gooey infested as doing the same thing on the uh, on Windows would be. Use Microsoft Edge, use Microsoft Edge, use Microsoft Edge. Apparently there's been a pop-up where they say, oh, Microsoft Edge is so much better than Chrome. It has the same technology, quote unquote, with the added trust of Microsoft. Yes. I'm not sure who that is supposed to convince, but uh, fair enough. Yeah, I kind of think somehow this AI stuff is going to work its way into embedded systems work, and hopefully the P2 can, you know, utilize it somehow. Quite honestly, I should stay away from that sort of thing because everyone's going to do that. There you go, Jeff. Uh, I was going to say, uh, speaking of uh, internet connected P2s, uh, I finally upgraded my last uh, light controller before I'm getting ready to pack all that stuff away. There was one that I didn't upgrade um, out in the yard. I have seven of them out there running all the lights and everything. And um, uh, one, I just, I just let it out. I wanted to see the uptime on it. I wanted to make sure that, you know, one that I didn't touch. That thing was was up for you know three months without uh, any intervention reboots or anything, and just before I disconnected the power out into the yard, I went out there and pressed the upgrade button in the browser, and it went out to Azure uh, Blob Storage, downloads the latest firmware, installs it on the SD card, and reboots and comes back up and with the new firmware on it. It's just like it just. P2 just works so amazingly well uh, compared to the uh, amalgamation of, uh, you know, like ARM chips and all these other things and the other light controller that I had the first year I tried to make that stuff work with the pixels. Uh, you know, it's just it's just so much more solid. You know, here's this thing out there in the yard that's going through temperature extremes. You know, it's uh, uh, got a big hole in the bottom of the enclosure for this thing. So it's exposed, uh, you know, directly, you know, between 90 degrees and, you know, below freezing <laughs> over that over the three month period. It just worked. You know, it's just amazing. It's a, yeah, it's probably just not complex enough to have all these issues. And the fact there's no garbage collection, memory allocation, and 
uh, memory leaks slowly bogging things down probably has a lot to do with it too. I think I think you're right. I mean, because it's you know, uh, it just has a you know a relatively simple loop that it executes in assembly to to do the things that it needs to do, and it doesn't need to do anything else, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, but it it worked well. It worked well. I'm just I'm just so pleased with it. <laughs> that's, that's What's cool. your network interface? Uh, I'm using uh, the Wisnet 6100. Uh, uh-huh. It's a supports uh, IPv4 and IPv6. And um, there's some recent talk on the forum of, um, well, I think it's in support of this EtherCAT stuff. Um, I mean, we could drive with the, the external magnetics and something, the P2 itself could drive the, the um, internet, yeah, the internet yeah. connection. I do have but, an Ethernet um, port that the other guy sent me, but... Uh... I haven't really used it yet. But, I, um, I don't Wi-Fi, think he even gave me yeah, example I'd, code, but I'd rather anyways, that avoid one I putting, think is direct. Uh, even in ESP32, which itself has an operating system on it almost, um, they, go, they get a little heavy on what they do, so it feels like your Linux desktop. <laughs> um, but yeah, we want to think is Wi-Fi or a cable, Ethernet cable, uh, a more direct approach. But either way, I think it should be kind of a plug-in module, uh, separate add-on. But uh, and you could charge more for it because everybody will buy it, and uh, you could probably make some good profit on that component alone. Tip, I have a project for you. Write a driver for a uh, the let's see the AI uh, code processor, USB code processor <laughs> for the P two. Wait, a driver, a USB yeah. driver. So they have these USB sticks. They're basically just they're just an AI code processor. They oh, do AI okay. work. Well, gosh, well, I mean AI, but how? What? What's the? Where's the data from? Right, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, AI co coprocessor means an awful lot of stuff. Um, and it seems like a great way to rope people into some marketing deal. Kind of subtly, like maybe they'll give you an AI in your Happy Meal someday, which will steer <laughs> you towards McDonald's products or something. Yeah. Would you like AI with that? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Jacob, is... um. Do you know anything about like what the premise of this thing is? Like, does it come pre-trained, or do you plug training data into it, or how does that? Uh, happen? You get a, I think you get to plug training data into it because it's all it is is instead of uh, sending the information to the cloud to be processed by a processor on a data in a like a, a database server uh, center. Sorry, database center. Um, you just do it on your own computer to save time. Like the new yeah. version of Windows does a lot of that in the OS. They do a lot of AI processing. And instead of sending it to the cloud or to a data center, you just do it on your computer and it saves time that way. Oh, yeah. And I other think, features too. I was looking when I was trying to figure out what kind of computer to buy, I was noticing that at least Intel, maybe AMD, they have they say they have AI stuff in their chips now, which is mm-hmm. probably some no. Just a lot I mean, of, they've like, been slow having speed. that for like years, but now they can call yeah. it something funny. They're I probably think, using uh, like the system AVX on chip the, GPU. Um, the AVX neural net extensions, I think, have existed since like, oh god, what what CPU generation introduced that? I don't know, but they have like these funny packed uh, formats that it can do. Sometimes they even have like a special processor that does this, just that sort of thing. Quite honestly, the best outcome of that is probably that someone's going to figure out how to use that for like music compression because music compression is actually a good mm-hmm. way to actually utilize this because if you think about how flag actually works it's like linear prediction and then storing rice codes between the difference of the linear prediction and what the actual waveform is so if you had a 
somewhat more advanced predict that it's maybe based on some sort of uh, longer neural network, you might be able to get past that sort of 60% efficiency uh, barrier that the uh, flag normally has. Maybe not, because a lot of that is basically just down to white noise. But I don't know. Is there a difference between like uh, an AI chip and a GPU? There's no difference between anything. The old chips. Well, no, I, I think it wouldn't. An, an AI chip would be some kind of giant uh, uh, summing, like multiplication and summing array, right? Which, which is what's needed for a neural network. Whereas a GPU is a bunch of processors that are sort of organized in a way and hooked to memory in a way where they're good at doing graphics. It's just pipelining, right? I mean, is that what AI is too? You, yeah, you could do either on both, but I know that like uh, Tesla's chip that they designed for their car is a giant like multiplication and summing array. I always thought that was a GPU. And it's they just started out using GPUs, but uh, but Tesla eventually did their own full custom chip and I uh -huh. think a 14 nanometer trifet process or something. And it was just a big summing array. And there's two of them on a die, so it's redundant. That's what I remember understanding. I could be wrong, but it better be redundant because imagine that shit failing out on uh, on the highway. That you don't have to imagine. I actually saw a video recently, sort of secondhand because it was someone else reacting to that video because that's the healthcare we live in. But um, basically, it was like were like two guys were like sitting in the Tesla driving uh, around in like San Francisco. You know the San Francisco Hill street thing i don't know what it's called but you know the one and they were driving on a tesla and they were like saying oh elon musk he's so smart he said oh we don't need all the other sensors meanwhile the car is constantly trying to ram into the uh parked cars on the side of the road and is also running a stop sign oh like it actually just pulls pull on just drives through the stop sign that like they could that... have died at that point if, the, if there was a, like uh, a car coming in from the other side yeah, but it's statistically safer than a human. And and then they go like hee 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 ha 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 oh, oh, oh. and then they uh keep like jerking it off like no yeah. it's not statistically safer, it literally just is constantly but trying to ram that? into shit. If Elon says well, something it's probably false. Treat that like a, a pair driver, not a pair programmer, but a pair driver. You shouldn't go to sleep on it and but it assist. I no, I think at least the way that it appears to be in the video, it was it would actually be worse than just driving it normally because you const your normal steering wheel isn't constantly trying to uh, ram into other cars. Like, what the fuck did they program this on? Kip, I believe that uh, your 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 question about hardware, uh, Nvidia have apparently has the best hardware available for doing AI work with their new... Anyways, hardware. if that's all we're going to talk about, I might as well as well leave. It's uh, very boring to me. And it's like partially well, I hear what he's, I want to hear... I, I mean, I think this stuff is worth discussing. I think your your view of this, Ada, is kind of like some sort of like... I, I, I'm, I'm just wondering if you're imagining in your brain like gears and... Uh, you know, intermeshing gears and complex mechanisms. So it's like highly deterministic. But I kind of think it's, there's a lot, of course it's deterministic, but I think there's also like things going on that kind of break out of the uh, mechanistic, I the, me the concept that is just purely mechanistic. I think it becomes a little bit more than that. Even though, yeah, at the end of the day, it's all and and or gates. I think there's stuff going on that is important. I don't know, I agree with Ada. I don't think it can be, I could do a lot of useful things that's been done before and variations of those, but something truly original, I don't think it's really capable of that. Well, the originality would come from kind of randomly combining things that it, it, that it has access to in new ways, which is sort of a creative thing. I, I mean, I, I've had conversations with chat GPT where I asked it to like, write songs and and say things about this in the 
in the person of like, uh, I don't know, someone with like a really distal way of speaking and personality in it, and it does it. So it's, to me, it's kind of like, uh, yeah, it's, it's all working within the, within the extant space of whatever has been done in the past. But I think it, for our perspective, it is kind of original because we don't know everything that's already happened. And it kind of brings that stuff out. Okay. And I'm not using asking it to come up with, invent some new thing nobody's ever heard of. But um, my ideas are combining things that have been done, but combined in novel ways. Right. And, and that, that combination of things I don't think has been done because everybody keeps telling me it can't be done. So uh, I'm using those tools to... Um, do these things that can be done, but in a different way. And so far, so good. Yeah, there's, there's a lot we don't know. And there's a lot that can be recombined recom in ways we haven't thought of. And then maybe there are some like things out there that this AI is never, ever going to touch upon or figure out, but will develop in time. That has to be true, too. The other thing to remember, Chip, is this technology is a little bit more than one year old. At least that's the first time I saw it back November a year a year ago from now, uh, twenty twenty two. This is the very early first generation. This thing is going to get so much better in the next five years. They've worked on it for a decade or more, but it was just in the last year when even the people creating it said. Holy shit, I didn't know I could do that. Yeah, I think that's kind and, of what happened. You know, when yeah. we started, when we first got our chip design tools back in the late 90s to start working on what was going to be Prop 1, the company that we bought those tools from was Tanner EDA. And they were like a small operation, I think in Pasadena, California. And um, they had all these examples and little white papers because they were a lot of military customers were using their tools to do small chips and uh, they had all these papers on neural network arrays and all this kind of stuff and that was like 24 34 36 years ago right late 80s was it then was it not or maybe yeah, i think it was then we got our chip no 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 it wasn't late 80s it was like mid nineties, mid nineties. We got the tool chips, but they had quite a corpus of uh, stuff related to what ultimately became this kind of technology, even back then. And it was like uh, a lot of things that were of military interest, not really uh, not consumer stuff. So this stuff's been in development for like long, long time. If you guys heard it that, took, Bill it Gates took wants the to create volume these, of the uh, internet. B Bill Gates wants to create a nuclear plant to power his AI. <laughs> yeah, a nuclear. But plant. it takes the entire Zero. corpus of the internet to power it too. So, yeah, uh, that was, I think, the why it couldn't have been done in the mid '90s. Well, uh, it just the, the volume. Uh, and the scale of connections, um, yeah, it, it's expressing something I think surprised uh, even the developers. Yeah, I mean, we have enough books that have been scanned now that can go in to feed it, and we've got cheap memory and cheap processors. And I mean, because that thing incorporated like 300 chat GPT, didn't it incorporate like 350 billion tokens in its training? So that just simply was some of those were uh, are like stripped directly from like pirate trackers. Mm. We say that again. Like, like they don't. Okay, like they don't we just, got that. They go to like uh, piracy sites and download the ebooks to train the like AI stuff. It's like it's mega fucked. Oh yeah, you know I see authors writing articles about how to remain relevant in the AI era because anybody's style can be copied. Like we had, my cousin was over for dinner and he had a friend here and I was telling him about chat GPT and he said that he liked some author. I can't remember this author's name, but I said, I asked chat GPT, write a story about this 
in this author's style. And Please never cranked, do that again. It's disgusting. It's it actually cranked out a story disgusting and, and inhuman it. and awful. Never do it again. Please. Wait, let me finish my story here. No, it, it's, but it's, 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 I can't. It, it fucks me up so much. I have to leave. Sorry. Ada, AI is here and it's never going to go. All right. Ada has left the meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, anyway, the, the guy completely recognized the author's style. And uh, I mean, that's just, again, it's like a recombinant effort, but it was pretty wild. I mean, this guy didn't know about ChatGPT, but he definitely recognized the author's style. Yeah, they put a limit on how much, how long of a story you're allowed to write when you do that. Yeah, it wasn't a very long story, but it was enough to show that it could do it. Because they, they don't want to create any violations. Yes. Yeah. Well, it is uh, midnight in Germany, Chip. That may be why Ida left us, but... I do want to leave you guys uh, in a few minutes here to myself. And I, I just want to say that artificial intelligence is something that we all need to be aware of. This thing is going to grow exponentially. Yes. And we should all be very careful about how it's regulated and how we ourselves use it. Uh, I, I read a, I saw a really good uh, demonstra uh, uh, conference on AI and it said, this is the two, 2024 is the last election in the United States. It's going to be determined by human beings. Future ones will be, term, be determined by the AI and who knows how to use it best. So it yeah, no, has I can definitely huge see, yeah. Yeah. negative potential. I think that's what Ada was worried about and didn't know how to vocalize. There, there's a lot of bad things that come, come out of this as well. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. The Harvard uh, C was the uh, the president of Harvard got kicked out because of AI. Oh, you think she used AI for the plagiarism? Use AI to find out the, to find her. Uh, oh, uh, I, AI exposed her. He exposed her. Yeah, basically, yeah, he was able yeah. to go through everybody's thesis and found that she ripped off somebody else's. Yeah, it's going to be a huge game changer, and it's going to it's going to have. I don't know. There are going to be some bad effects from all this. And the fact is, you and I on this meeting, we're not going to, you know, we have very little say in what's going to happen. We're just a couple people. And there are other people that are positioned to really leverage it against everybody else. And that's just how it's going to be. I remember Musk saying that people. So are I, uh, I, say please, I say please and thank you whenever I'm asking for things from perplexity. <laughs> I want to be on the right side of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I just I, and, and frankly, frankly, it, it's it's just expressing myself in English. You know, I've spent a long time, you know, trying to dumb down and and, and just get keywords into my queries, but I don't have to do that effort now. I can just speak as I speak, and it seems to. Uh, respond even better than if I cut it down to just keywords. Yes. No, I found that with, with G GPT, the more articulate you can be, even using like a bigger vocabulary, it gets better results out of it. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's an amplifier is what it is. I think one of the things that we're going to see a lot of uh, pushback on with using AI is that the, some some things that are going to go away are copyrights and trademarks and patents, things like that, that we have been using for a long, long time. All those things are going to go away. Uh, much to our chagrin. I mean, yeah, it's going to kind of melt into the pot. Yeah, it is, because it's going to be all those things are going to be absorbed by AI, and that that means a lot of our individuality that we've been used to with all these things is just going to go away. Well, they're going to try to make us feel. They're going to try to, uh, I'm sure, make people feel like their individuality is diminished. But I don't know. It's gonna it's gonna be hard because they're gonna 
frame enough of the context that we live in that we're not going to know the boundaries between what we would think, what they're having us think, and on and on. Yeah. The, the thing that bothers me the most about AI is the people who make the laws in our country, Congress, are the ones who know the least about AI. And they'll be writing the laws and the regulations about us using AI. Once it, get, it starts to become what they consider dangerous, and that will be a real problem. But yeah. well, yeah. if we get AI to uh, fight for us on our side, <laughs> we can <laughs> uh, sway them, lobby the government back. It's gonna be well, AI yeah. versus AI. All right, I think it's a good time to stop recording and keep, yeah. uh, we've been on AI for an hour, more than an hour, so. Um, I well, I thought recording. it was an interesting conversation anyway. Yeah, and it was somehow related to Propeller. We kept coming back about how to unleash AI for documentation of the Propeller or helping program the Propeller, so it was still related, but. I don't know. Uh, okay. Okay, you want me to Let's hit stop for, for the, for the uh, 